Um, next up is uh, Carl Dong, but he's still in the US. So we're gonna have a video of him that he just recorded uh, to give the talk. After the talk, he'll go, he's going to do the live Q&A uh, with us. So hopefully that will work. The video should be fine, the live q and I'm just hoping for the best. And uh, yeah, so, Carl. Hello everyone, my name is Carl Dong. I work for Chaincode Labs, and I'm going to be talking about Bitcoin's build system security. Unfortunately, I couldn't make it to Amsterdam this year, but I hope that the graphics I've prepared for this talk can still capture your attention and make up for my absence. Let's begin. So, let's say you want to be a good Bitcoin citizen and start running and using your own Bitcoin node. You go to bitcoincore.org and you click the download button, you open the disk image and you double click on Bitcoin Core. Huh, you get this warning. Now, if you're as paranoid as I am, you start to wonder. I downloaded this disk image from bitcoincore.org, but why should I trust it? Do I know that bitcoincore.org is the right website and not some phishing scheme? How about bitcoin.com? That website sounds much more official. Well, today, I'm going to take you on a journey through Bitcoin's build system, show you how you can verify that your Bitcoin download is the right one, and explain some improvements to this system that's in the works. So, let's go back to this disk image that you downloaded. Perhaps you'll wonder, where did this disk image come from? How was it made? Well, we know that all software was computer source code at some point, and in our case, we expect this to be the Bitcoin source code at version 0.18. The source code is fed as input to a toolchain, including compilers, linkers, archivers, the whole shebang, which then builds the source code into the binary output, which is the disk image file you downloaded. But knowing this doesn't give us any guarantees. How do we know that the binary we downloaded from bitcoincore.org corresponds to the Bitcoin 0.18 source code? How do we know that whoever uploaded this binary didn't modify the source code so that it uploads your private keys to a malicious server? This is where Gitian reproducible builds come in. What Gitian ensures is that given identical source code, we will get identical binary outputs. This means that anyone can use the source code of Bitcoin at version 0.18 and produce a disk image identical to the one we downloaded earlier. In other words, we don't have to trust bitcoincore.org. We can verify for ourselves that the disk image we downloaded came from the source of Bitcoin at version 0.18. In fact, there is a repository called gitian.sigs where maintainers upload signed gitian.assert files. This might look a little intimidating at first, but it really isn't. These files are generated by the build process and declare what source code they used and what the resulting hash of the binary output is. This hash should be identical to the hashes of the binary we downloaded at the very beginning of the talk from bitcoincore.org, and if they differ, we know that something is wrong. These .assert files are generated whenever we do a Gitian build from source. And when generated by different people, these gitian.assert files should still agree with each other. And if they don't, we know something's up. So that is what we mean by reproducible builds. Gitian is one project in a wider effort across software projects to make builds reproducible so that we have better guarantees about what we're running on our machines. Great. However, I'm here to tell you that reproducibility is not enough. And the reason why goes back to trust. Before we had reproducibility, we had to trust that the Bitcoin binary we downloaded was not malicious. But with Gitian builds, we're actually still trusting something. And that something can be found if you just scroll down a little in the Gitian.assert file. All of these .deb files are what we're trusting. These are the tools that we use to build Bitcoin, and they are what makes up the toolchain I mentioned before. And the thing is that they are 
all trusted binaries that we download from Ubuntu servers. So we basically have the same problem as before with the disk image, as in we again have to trust that nobody put anything malicious in these tools as these build tools can be used to inject backdoors into the Bitcoin binaries they produce. To demonstrate what, what exactly can happen, we can look to Mick's Quora answer to the question, what's a coder's worst nightmare? In his answer, Mick describes how he was tasked with debugging a simple program on an AT&T 3B2 series computer that had been poisoned by an ex-grad student. That program was actually very simple, and it was designed to print a question, then wait for a response. However, what the program actually did was it printed some white supremacy message, waited half a second, and then overwrote it with the actual question. So obviously, there's something wrong with the source code. And Mick edits the source code, deletes the offending line, and recompile, thinking that that would be that. But oh no, he ran the program again and lo and behold, the subliminal messages were still there. And the source code had the offending lines reinserted. He tried several other techniques, searching through the include areas, recompiling the standard library, even learning 3B2 assembly. He finally reached his epiphany on day 15 when he realizes that it's in the tool chain. Every time you use the tool chain to compile the original code, it puts the malicious code back into the source, meaning that the binary output would also be infected. Mick's story reveals why reproducibility is not enough and even completely clean source code is not enough. In terms of Gitian, even if we're reproducible, the tool chain that Gitian downloads, trusts, and uses to build Bitcoin source code can still be malicious. In other words, we might be reproducible, but we might also be reproducibly malicious. To put it another way, the problem with Gitian is that although Bitcoin binaries can be reproducibly built, the tools used to perform that build is hard to audit and could still be malicious, resulting in a reproducibly malicious Bitcoin binary. What compounds this problem is the nature of how tool chains are produced. You might ask, where do these compilers and linkers that make up the tool chain we download come from? Well, I liken the process to an old recipe for yogurt. How do you make yogurt? Well, you take some milk and you add it to some existing yogurt that you already have to make more yogurt. Similarly, the way you make a tool chain is you take some tool chain source code and you give it to a tool chain you already have to make more tool chain. Yum. Here's where we come back to Mick's journey as it's not over yet. After his epiphany, Mick gets an AT&T tech to show up with five and a quarter inch floppies and loads the proper compiler and linker source so they can recompile the compiler, making the yogurt from yogurt. He thinks that that would solve it, but oh boy was he mistaken. The existing malicious compiler had another trick up its sleeve. It was able to recognize when it was building another tool chain and to inject the same malicious behavior to the output tool chain. Let that sink in for a minute. The compiler was somehow able to replicate and poison successful generations of itself. Truly the stuff of nightmares. This is similar to an attack that Ken Thompson, the person behind Unix, UTF-8, and Golang, described in his 1984 Turing Award acceptance speech, Reflections on Trusting Trust. In that speech, he described how, because tool chains are built by older versions of themselves, you can poison an entire line of them just by poisoning one generation, and it would propagate down to future generations, even if the source code was clean. For another example in Rust, Manish of Mozilla also wrote a proof-of-concept article detailing how one might execute this trusting trust attack on the notoriously hard-to-bootstrap Rust compiler. So, 
what can we do about the fact that our toolchain consists of countless trusted binaries that can be reproducibly malicious and the possibility of a trusting trust attack? We need to be more than reproducible. We need to be bootstrappable. What does that mean, being bootstrappable? It means that we cannot have that many binary tools that we need to download and trust from external servers controlled by other organizations. It means that we should know how these tools are built and exactly how we can go through the process of building them again, preferably from a much smaller set of trusted binaries. In other words, we need to minimize our set of trusted binaries as much as possible and maintain an easily auditable path from those binaries to the particular tool chain that we use to build Bitcoin. This allows us to minimize trust and maximize verification. How do we achieve this? How do we ensure that Bitcoin users are running the code they expect to be running? I believe the way forward is through using functional package managers like Geeks. Geeks is a package manager where bootstrappability and auditability are fundamental tenets. As a functional package manager, every single binary output that Geeks produces is a pure function of that package's source code and the toolchain used to produce it, meaning that every single package that Geeks builds can be traced back to a minimal set of trusted binaries. Let me show you what I mean by using a handy command called Geeks Graph. We can invoke Geeks Graph on a package, let's say Bash, and it will give us its runtime dependencies. If you give it a few more flags, we are shown its build time dependencies. With even more flags, it will show us the complete graph of dependencies right down to its minimal set of bootstrap binaries. For some clarity, here's the bottom part of that graph cleaned up a bit. In Geeks, every single package's dependency graph will include this graph whose syncs are the only binaries that we have to download and trust. For those who like to reason about build dependency graphs like this, notice how these are directed acyclic graphs. Just for reference, and I don't want anyone to take this as me bad-mouthing Debian, it is a miracle that they're able to maintain their package set this well. Just for reference, Debian's package set has many loops in their dependency graph, and even a strongly connected component of 2,000 plus packages, which looked something like this back in 2013. That strongly connected component also seemingly have taken on a life of its own and has grown significantly since they started measuring its size. So what does all of this mean for our toolchain? Geeks means that when we use it to build our toolchain, we can audit how each tool in our toolchain was built and easily bootstrap them from a small set of trusted binaries. This is in stark contrast to our current Gitian process of building Bitcoin from a huge set of trusted binaries that we pull from Ubuntu servers. Geeks' unique properties is why I think the Software Heritage Archives chose to partner with it for long-term reproducibility why it was one of the first package managers slash distros to be able to bootstrap Rust-C from source, the Rust compiler, and why many scientific institutions across the world choose it for their reproducible scientific workflows in high-performance computing environments. This is the work that I've been doing for the past few months, replacing Gitian with Geeks so that we can have bootstrappable and reproducible builds for Bitcoin. Currently, I have working Bitcoin builds for all supported Linux architectures using Geeks, and I'm working on OS X and Windows builds. One of the nice side effects of Geeks being bootstrappable is the elimination of some of the nasty dependencies that were previously used and caused our Gitian build guides and scripts to be long, confusing, and mostly distro and architecture specific. With the current scope of my PR, we will be able to perform reproducible, bootstrappable builds on any Linux distro, and with some more work, we might even be able to perform these builds on any architecture. There's one last thing I want to talk about, and that is the ongoing work to enable a reduced binary seed bootstrapping geeks led by Yannicka. Currently, 
Geeks' set of bootstrap binaries weigh in at 232 megabytes, which is already a fraction of that of Debian-based distros. With Yannicka's current version of MESS, which is already working in Geeks' core updates branch, we can eliminate GCC as a trusted binary, mitigating the trusting trust attack and bring our number down to 131 megabytes. Yannicka's work has been recently funded by NLNet and will go on to eliminate core utils, guile, and eventually itself with a C subset transpiler. Even more exciting is the work being pursued by Orion's J on Hex Zero, a 357 byte, heavily commented, self hosting Hex assembler that will eventually be used as the only trusted binary. The holy grail for bootstrapability will be connecting Hex Zero to MESS. I want to give special thanks to Chaincode for graciously giving me the chance to dig deeper into this subject, Corey Fields for tolerating my non-stop bombardment of questions and patiently teaching me the ins and outs of build system security, Rust Yanofsky for telling me about the MESS project, sparking this journey down the rabbit hole of bootstrappable package managers, the good folks on the IRC channels, Bootstrappable, and Geeks for helping me along the way. And of course, Marty for lending me his sick microphone setup. Please go check out his podcast, Tales from the Crypt. Here are some links for those who want to learn more about what I discussed today. And thank you for listening to me ramble. Right, uh, we're going to try the call, but I don't know if Carl can hear me. Yes, hello. All right. So, anybody has questions? <laughs> can we, yeah. It's super hard to type on the French keyboard. I can't yeah. even see the smiley face. Yeah, hello. Yeah, so uh, I don't know if you could type it. <laughs> uh, like, it might be uh, uh, a lot of words. But uh, my question is uh, about this uh, hex zero assembler, right? Uh, so uh, if I would do this, I, I would take like simple assembler like this, uh, code into, into like instructions, uh, machine code, not in the assembler, and then build a simple Lisp interpreter uh, in it, and then, and that uh, you use that to create uh, 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 like existing uh, C compiler in, in Lisps. Uh, there are existing C compilers. So, uh, is there, yes, Zeta C, like from 80s. Uh, so uh, what is their uh, proposed, uh, how do you say, sorry. <laughs> what, what, yeah, what is the proposed idea for, to, to go from this hex, uh, hex zero to work in C compiler to compile all these dependencies, and does it involve uh, coding strides uh, C compiler for by in the assembler or going through fourth interpreters or Lisp interpreters? Thank Uh, okay, I think I'm able to get this question from uh, from Brian, um, and uh, you know I think you're asking what's the proposed idea from going hex zero to a working C compiler. So the uh, we we've, we've already basically got um, all the you know all the steps from mess to Geeks, uh, and mess is implemented in this uh, C subset. So. Basically, what we want is to have hex zero be able to bootstrap itself up to its C subset. Uh, does it involve coding the C compiler from assembly? 
Um, no, it, it actually, well, it involves coding. So, so the way that they've been able to do this bootstrap is sort of define, um, you know, different subsets of C that, you know, people can transpile down. Uh, and so it doesn't really involve coding the C compiler from assembly. I know that there is, because Orion's J is a crazy person. Um, he has he has a working implementation of hex zero in this um, uh, uh, ISA called the Knights virtual machine. So so you you and and that hex can just be loaded in onto bare metal, as in bare metal, as in you know you you, you toggle switches to lay out the hex assembler into memory, and then you set the program counter and you know, have the ISA run, right? So you can, you can implement that ISA um, in any kind of hardware like FPGAs or ASICs or what, what have you, and run hex zero, which will bootstrap itself into you know, its own hex assembler and then you know, go language up from there. Um, going through forks and comparators and lists, list comparators. I'm actually not that not too sure what you mean by comparators, um, but I think that's the way they, they've been trying to do it is bootstrap through the languages. I have a very short question. How does Geeks compare to Nix? Nix being another functional package manager? Well, short, right? Ah, okay, yeah. Um, I, I'd love to talk about that. Um, I, I love Nix. Um, if, if maybe if, if you guys have seen, you know, uh, Nix now has a, a Bitcoin daemon uh, service, and, and you know, I, I, I submitted that PR. Um, so they're, they're both functional package managers, and actually, Geeks is compatible with Nix's uh, package builder. They, they they speak the same interface. Um, but I, I would say that Geeks has more of a focus on bootstrap ability, as in they really care about bootstrap. And all these projects like, you know, MESS and Hex Zero, Stage Zero, um, they all are targeting Geeks at first. And, you know, there's a reason why MESS is already in the core updates branch instead of uh, being in Nix, right? I think another advantage um, that Geeks has that maybe other people will argue is not an advantage, um, but it's that it's uh, it's implemented in a, a, a Lispy schemey language. Uh, I, I really believe that you know to be able to script packages and all that, we we want something that is a little more powerful, something where we don't have to learn another DSL or something like that. We can we can reuse the languages that we already have um, to build these um, you know powerful ways to resolve packages down to what they're supposed to be. And, and one of the cool things that I found out working with this is that, like, to build a cross compiler for a certain architecture, um, I have like this procedure. Procedure procedures are really what functions are in Lisp, right? I have this procedure that literally takes in a uh, you know a target triple, right? Like uh, you know ARM ARM sixty four something like that, right? Uh, and then I give it a package for like GCC8, and then I give it a package for glibc, and then I give it a package for binutils, and it just generates a package for me that's like, oh, here's a compiler, here's a cross compiler um, for this architecture, uh, and you can build it and use it in the environment. Um, so it's very composable in that way, and I think that's um, that's one of the main advantages. Yeah. Hi. Uh, how long does it take to bootstrap the current Bitcoin Core toolchain from the original Hex Zero um, yeah, uh, toolchain um, with the GUI X that you just presented and without? Oh, I see. Um, so we we don't have the working bootstrap from hex zero yet. We have the working bootstrap from mess. Um, it's really hard to say how long it will take because uh, Geeks, is, Geeks is really good about 
parallelism. So me running it on my you know 24 core um, workstation is going to be vastly different from somebody running it on their laptop or their Raspberry Pi or whatever. Um, however, the good thing is the the very bottom steps of the bootstrap path are all reproducible, right? So here's here's here, here's 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 what's good about that is that because they're reproducible, you can choose your level of trust, right? Do you want to trust that you know uh, a GCC that one of the build farms built is okay, and your your friend has also has also done the bootstrap and they have matching hashes, right? Uh, Geeks actually has really cool tools like um, Geeks Challenge, where you give it a URL where people publish hashes and can do Geeks Challenge, and I'll tell you. If they're identical or not, where you know where they differed, and if they're inconclusive, all of those, um, and so you can really choose your level of trust, and it, it, it sort of allows for a very granular trade-off between uh, trusting and the time to um, build everything. Right? Um, and and also Geeks is Geeks is very like I, I know like for some package managers like uh, Pacman. They don't recommend you use any like dash J flag, so like builds are really slow. Um, Geeks actively tries to break packages that don't like don't work well with dash J and try to patch them so that the parallelism works. So um, it'll be able to take care. Uh, it'll be able to use all the cores that you have. Uh, one of the other things that's uh, great about it is you can actually um, have Geeks builders running on other machines. Uh, like you can, you know, maybe you have like five servers somewhere that's lying around. You could just boot them up uh, and then put Geeks builders on them and then point your local machine to them and they'll do the building for you and your laptop doesn't beat up. So that's cool. Uh, let's say, okay. Apparently there's. I can ask a question anyway. So question over signal. What <laughs> so what if the hardware is poisoned? Okay. Uh, what is the status of Rust bootstrapability? Uh, we can bootstrap it from source. Uh, we can uh, so uh, Rust bootstrapability has not been done by sort of the Rust core team. It's been done by uh, this one guy who wrote MRC, which is an implementation of Rust 1.19 um, in C plus plus, right? Um, so it it. It's it's a it's a it's a it's a pretty good implementation. It works, and Geeks is one of those uh, package managers that have packaged it and is able to bootstrap. You know, Rust two point. I don't know which one they bootstrapped up to. Probably the latest one um, from uh, uh, one dot nineteen. Um, so that works. Um, I, I think the only other distro that has this bootstrapability is Slackware, and unfortunately, nobody uses Slackware. Um, yes, cross compile does work. Cross compile does work, um, and cross compile is really cool in Geeks. I think because you really, you really just do Geeks build dash dash target equals, and you give it a triple, and then you give it a package, and it's going to cross compile for that um, for that system, and and that's really cool. And and what you can actually do is, uh, I forgot what the flag is, but you can if you want to run the uh, thing that you cross compiled, um, if you run Geeks as an operating system, it knows how to enable kernel flags and all that. If you want to run the thing that you enable, that you can use something called binfunct, which will apparently map the syscalls of different architectures to the native one. I I'm, I'm not 100% sure how it works, but basically you're able to run this binary that you just cross compiled to like another architecture on your native architecture and test it, which is which, which is I think pretty cool. So what if the ah okay okay all right that's that's good I li okay I'm good I'm glad I prepared okay uh, what if the hardware is poison um, so that's something that again Orion's J the crazy guy has been working on um, so th this is the whole um, premise behind him defining. A, uh, a an ISA, right? In that once you have an ISA, you have a standard that anybody can implement. And this ISA, according to him, has been really, uh, is really, really old. I think it came from like the 60s. So it, you know that it can be easily implemented, right? So you can implement that ISA in P 
you told me it's called TTL, transistor transistor logic. I, I don't know that much about hardware. I've just been like listening to him rant about it on bootstrapability. Um, and so you're able to, if you're able to implement that ISA, then we have a actually 250 byte implementation of hex zero in that ISA. And as I said before, you can toggle switches, put things in memory, set the program counter, and then bootstrap from there, right? So, if, you know, if, if anybody wants to implement actual hardware for the Knights ISA, um, feel free to. I know that our NSJ is probably going to do that. No question anymore. All right, well, he doesn't hear me, so um, <laughs> thanks, Carl. All right, you can write that back. Yes, yes. Thank you. Awesome. We did it.